So yeah, I'm uh, I'm Chuck Willis, and uh, as uh, Glenn mentioned, you know, this is we're going to be talking here about data at rest at Krypton. It's going to actually, you know, kind of follow on from the, the keynote that we just had. So I'm I'm excited to, to get into this topic. So just a quick note about me. I think he already did a bit of the introduction. Just uh, I am in the D.C. area, so I'm part of the OAuth Northern Virginia chapter. When there when there has been a Maryland or a D.C. chapter, I usually participate in those as well. And I also um, a while ago, created the OWASP Broken Web Applications Project. It's a virtual machine full of uh, web applications with various types of vulnerabilities. You can use it for training or for testing tools, that sort of thing. If uh, you have any, uh, I haven't updated that in a while, so but the, the, the current version still works. It's a, it's a virtual machine, so it actually you know it gets more and more vulnerabilities as time goes on. It's the, the libraries and components that it uses get older and older. So definitely check that out. And uh, my just a random fact, my favorite movie, The Blues Brothers. I'm originally from the Chicago area, so I think you're kind of required to like that movie if you're from that area. Uh, so I'm gonna let Weiss introduce himself. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Weiss. Um, I spent 20 years in the InfoSec community and um, focused mostly on uh, incident response and threat countermeasures, as well as encryption and cryptography. I'm based in San Diego, so part of the OWASP in San Diego community. Um, and I've lived in Germany, the U.S., Singapore, and Japan. And randomly, my favorite pizza topping is, boringly, cheese. I'm glad you said it. I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna call out the, uh, the boringness of the cheese topping. So here's a quick uh, note of what we're going to uh, talk about. So you know, just really a, a quick primer on cryptography and encryption and key management, just to kind of make sure everyone's on the same page, and then. Uh, Weiss is really going to go into detail on kind of you know the issues with the current you know data at rest encryption approaches that are used, and you know why that's a problem. And then uh, I'll come back at the end to talk more about you know some some alternative approaches that can help in kind of closing the gap that's there. Um, we'll also have you know up till the end of the end of the hour as far as for Q and A. So if you've got questions, yeah, please submit those through the uh, Whova platform. And uh, also, you know, keep an eye on that as far as if you see questions that you're interested in hearing us answer, you know, upload those so that way they'll kind of work their way to the top and uh, Glenn will provide those at the end. So yeah, so cryptographic failures, you, you may know that from the, the new 2021 um, OAuth top 10. So um, you can see that it used to be kind of rolled into a bunch of other things uh, as part of sensitive data exposure uh, in 2017. But uh, now it's been broken out into kind of its own its own um, separate line item on the OS top ten uh, as cryptographic failures, and it's also moved up in popularity. It's it's gone above um, injection and you know, really above everything else other than broken access control. So it's a very common problem nowadays that people are are recognizing. I think it's been around for a while. It's just that it's uh, become more to the forefront. Maybe. Uh, partially because we're trying to deal with things like SQL injection and cross-site scripting a lot better as far as kind of the framework layer. Um, so as those are less common than we see, you know, access control and cryptographic failures become you know, kind of relatively more common. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the kind of the, the documentation for the OWASP top 10 that's on the, the website, the, the, exact, the first scenario here uh, that's shown is exactly kind of what we want to talk about today. So. In this case, it's a, it's a, the example is an application that has credit card numbers that it wants to protect. But the way it's protecting them is it's got you know, automatic database encryption happening. So there's you know, transparent encryption at either the database or the, the file um, you know, kind of block storage level. And therefore, because it's automatically getting encrypted and decrypted, when you have a SQL injection flaw in the application, it's just gonna pull out all the decrypted data. So there's no, it's the, even though it's encrypted, it's not you know, providing protection against this type of an attack. So like I said, uh, uh, cryptographic failures have been around a while. So you might, might think they're the new kid on the block, but in reality, they're more like the, the upper right corner here. It's the, the current <laughs> version of the new kids on the block as far as from their 2021 tour promos. So it's, uh, it's been around for a long time. So let's go a little bit more in detail into the situation. So, you know, when you talk about cryptography, I mean, cryptography, you know, existed long before computers. So they had, you know, this type of instrument in the upper right is, is you know, a, a thing for a Caesar type cipher, simple substitution cipher. Um, you have the Enigma machines and other sorts of kind of mechanical and, and various sorts of uh, cryptographic um, systems that were around. 
And so when computer security came around, or uh, well, when computers came around, the, you know, an obvious application for them was cryptography, but also an obvious um, kind of mechanism that could be used as part of securing computers was, was cryptography. And, you know, for, you know, some number of years, computer security really did focus on cryptography. They were really concerned about this type of thing of, you know, hey, we want to, you know, encrypt some data that's going to be sent over, you know, an untrusted media medium like, you know, radio waves. Therefore, we need to, you know, have the ability to encrypt it and decrypt it. And there was quite a bit of work has been done over the years into, you know, algorithms and modes that are, are very resistant to, you know, various types of attacks. So, uh, you know, on the left here, lower left, we've got uh, a kind of a diagram of the AES algorithm and kind of the rounds that it uses for, you know, encryption on the left and decryption on the right going up. Um, on the bottom here, we have the central blockchaining kind of mode of encryption that allows you to, um, you know, be more resistant to changes to data or mixing of packets and things like that. So there's a, there's been a lot of work into that and, and it's, it's paid off pretty well. So, you know, if you're looking at kind of directly attacking, you know, kind of modern cryptography, it's, it's very strong, you know, not to say it's perfect, you know, maybe nation states uh, have the ability to, to do certain things, but I think even in those cases, you've got, you know, additional mechanisms you can use if you're really that concerned about, you know, the cryptography itself. So one example is you could layer encryption. So you could have multiple algorithms that are, you know, used at different layers. The uh, example of that might be, you know, you might have a layer two encryption device that does kind of point to point VPN type connections and then have a, a layer three or a, a session layer HTTPS type encryption on top of that. And uh, so, so that's one option. Uh, I know the government sometimes will use multiple types of commercial um, you know, VPN devices kind of layered on top of one another in order to provide additional security. So even if there's a, a vulnerability in, you know, a Acme product, uh, then hopefully it's not going to affect, you know, the other product as well. So by having kind of these completely separate things layered on top of one another, you're giving yourself a lot better uh, protection against attacks. Um, and then for some algorithms like hashing algorithms or um, uh, in like RSA, uh, asymmetric algorithms, you know, you can basically have keys as long as you want. Um, so if you're really concerned about brute force, then, you know, you can make that basically impractical. Um, if you're hashing passwords, you can, you know, make the um, process to hash the password down to the, um, you know, hash value take, you know, as long as you want. So to make, uh, you know, password stuffing type attacks take longer. And uh, so there's uh, quite a bit of flexibility there. Uh, they've even got you know crypto algorithms that have been designed to to be resistant to quantum computing. So even if quantum computers become you know practical, then you could potentially uh, you know not have to worry about that as far as uh, in your system. Might be worth looking at if you're if you're building kind of a, a trust anchor that's going to be used for for quite some time. And then there's also you know hardware cryptographic devices. So there's devices that'll give you you know secure random numbers that'll and devices that will kind of come with pre-baked in keys that, you know, can't be extracted. So the only way to encrypt or decrypt data is to pass it to this cryptographic device and it'll, you know, give you back the corresponding um, ciphertext or plain text, but it basically prevents you from losing the keys because they can never lose the device. And, and you'll even see Microsoft, I, I believe, is making use of the trusted platform module on Windows 11 uh, to do some of this kind of stuff to have kind of that trusted group of the overall system. And then, uh, you know, so the only real limitation well, when it comes to kind of layering these things or, or, or other things that I just mentioned is, is performance. So if you're concerned about, you know, how much your latency is going to be affected or what your bandwidth is going to be, then that's, you know, the, the only thing really that you need to worry about. But the good thing is that, you know, computers keep getting faster and networks keep getting bigger. So I think, uh, you know, you can pretty much wait a little bit and uh, make up for that. So the, the problem really as, a, as the previous, you know, keynote speaker talked about is, is really keys. So you need to have secure cryptographic keys. Um, if you look in the, the bottom left there, we've got the, the guy from the matrix, the key maker. So you've got to make sure that you're creating keys that are, um, that are secure and you've got you know a secure source of randomness or whatever to generate those keys but it's more than just making the keys you, there's a whole life cycle that goes around keys so not just the, the generation that's shown here but also you know, where you're storing them how do you distribute them rotating and expiration all this stuff that uh, goes into it so you don't just need a key maker you really need the, the key master 
So these are just a bunch of quotes that, from various people that have uh, said what uh, I think has already been said today as well. Is you know really key management is the hard part. And my, my favorite one is the one in the middle here that you know cryptography turns hard security problems into hard key management problems. So it, so that's not to say that you know cryptography is 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 worthless. I mean it's certainly helping you and it's giving you a a way of making the problem more uh, manageable. But it does you know not remove it entirely you've got to worry about you know how are you going to manage the keys that are associated with this encrypted data and protect them appropriately because that's where the attackers are going to go after and then just again as a, as a primer just so uh you know there's two types of uh use, use cases really for encryption so you've got the ability to have uh protection of, of data in transit so while it's traversing the network um this is a uh, a simpler problem, I suppose, than what we'll talk about in a second, because you know there's a short period of time between at least when the data is encrypted and decrypted or, or signed and verified. At least that's the intention. Um, so you can have um, you know ephemeral keys, maybe that uh, you you use some sort of secure key exchange to come up with, uh, as long as you have you know some sort of trust anchor to to make sure that you're creating the keys with the right people. Um, you know, you do need to worry about, you know, what if somebody's going to, you know, capture all your network traffic and then try to analyze it later. So you want it to be resistant against attacks in the long term. But as far as being able to decrypt the data, you don't necessarily have to store the keys. You can, uh, as long as you have them for the, the period of time, the short period of time that you need to decrypt them. And then the opposite is, is data at rest. So while data is stored, you need to worry about, you know, not just encrypting the keys, um, but because there's a long time between when the data is encrypted and then when it's going to be decrypted or signed and then verified, uh, really the decryption keys, uh, the storage and protection of those is, is very important. So you, you've kind of shifted the problem from, you know, once the data is encrypted and signed and everything properly, if you're using right algorithms, all that, you know, you don't necessarily need to worry as much about uh, confidentiality or integrity of the encrypted data, but you do need to worry about that for the keys. The thing is, at least keys is a much smaller piece of data that you need to worry about than, uh, you know, kind of arbitrarily long uh, documents and other things. So the, the good news is that, uh, you know, data in transit is, is really basically a solved problem. Um, you know, for uh, the, the fact is that, you know, if you're communicating with some other system on the network, um, you generally are going to use, you know, TLS or maybe one of its predecessors. And, and there's a well-established mechanism for not only kind of establishing keys and using you know, the right algorithms, but also for um, a certificate authority system and how you can do that. And, you know, web browsers have their built-in certificate authorities, but if you don't care, uh, you don't necessarily trust all of those certificate authorities, then you can have your own kind of more minimal set of certificate authorities that you're going to trust and, you know, use as part of your system. So, so that's really the, the good news. And so now I'm going to kick it over to Weiss to, to really talk about uh, the rest of the problem. Thanks, Chuck. So, so on to the bad news. Um, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I think most of the community has known sort of this core problem for a while. And it's sort of now becoming more prominent uh, as we have sort of more modern approaches. But the key takeaway here is, is most data at rest encryption solutions are ineffective against modern threats. And that's primarily because they're built on what's referred to as a central implicit trust model. The idea being that the server and the people who administer a server, whether it's a database server or, or a file server, have the ability to access data in the clear or in plain text uh, in order to perform their, their core job functions. So as you, as you can imagine, this is something that we definitely wanna tackle. Um, so moving on, I'll cover a little bit about the central implicit trust model. Um, again, the central implicit trust model essentially suggests that key system processes and users have access to plain text data um, in order to perform a number of job functions. It could be to administer a database server. It could be for the database server to, to, to operate so that it could perform its core functions. So this means that folks like database admins, system admins, uh, database server itself, the hypervisor host, if you're running in a virtualized environment, administrator, they're uh, you're working with a uh, you know a very prominent well um, and and they're sort of helping you manage your infrastructure, uh, or you have cloud administrators on site with cloud uh, access, uh, or the cloud provider. Uh, all these individuals have the ability to view data in the plain text. That's another reason which we'll unpack 
uh, in the next few slides. And the other thing I'll, I'll mention uh, before we move on to sort of what that and some key examples of, of how are exploring this, this sort of flawed and implicit trust model is that it happens to be a, the antithesis of trust model. For trust model, the whole idea is that trust no one. Uh, there should be no implied trust system, process, or an individual, um, except the central implicit plus model is built upon the exact opposite, which is we trust everyone uh, and allow them to be able to access data again in the plain text. So you might be asking the obvious, well, what's the problem with the central implicit trust model? Well, consider two scenarios. I'm gonna walk you through first is sort of logical vulnerabilities. And then I'll walk you through a number of application specific vulnerabilities. So starting with the logical vulnerabilities first, if you have a security incident involving, say, as Glenn mentioned earlier, an insider threat, uh, say you have an employee uh, with admin access, um, the intention may not be nefarious, uh, but they have admin access to, to a database or a data warehouse, and they accidentally you know, export the data in, into, into a file share, or maybe it's a nefarious in, in, intended uh, individual, they have access to the plain text by the sheer virtue of the job that they're performing as a database admin or a data warehouse admin or a cloud admin. Consider the next scenario of a supply chain attack. Um, let's say a provider that you're working with, whether it's a SaaS provider or a cloud provider where you're literally just hosting your data, imagine that they suffer a breach uh, and they're compromised for a period of time. And that compromised environment is now exposing your data. And the attackers who've compromised the cloud provider then retrieve cloud administrative credentials. They have the ability to view the data in plain text. And then lastly, advanced attackers, your data theft. Um, generally, you're talking about sort of nation state attackers or, or fairly more sophisticated attackers that have the time and resources to be able to, to compromise the network and ultimately systems. One of the first things that they do is they seek out credentials through credential harvesting. Um, and once they have those credentials for the databases or the data warehouses or, or wherever the data of, of value may be stored, they then use those authorized credentials to be able to access data. They usually encrypt the data with a key that you can't access and then they exfiltrate it and we know, sort of know how that story ends. But the key theme here is that, you know, all these uh, sort of attacks are enabled by the fact that the underlying systems that we rely on heavily to ensure that data is encrypted don't actually work and are not effective against these types of more modern attacks. Now I'll spend a few minutes covering application vulnerabilities and I'll tie them to the various uh, OWASP top 10 uh, list items. The first one is access control, right? An attacker can modify an access control check uh, or metadata to get access to privileged accounts. And that's actually the number one thing on the list. And I'll actually give you a real world example of where this occurred uh, in a couple of minutes, but that's, that's a very, very prominent one. The second area is around authentication. Um, an attacker can perform a credential stuffing attack. Chuck mentioned that a few minutes ago as well, to gain access to privileged accounts and data. Very similar to some of the logical vulnerabilities that I mentioned on our previous slide. Um, they're using some sort of vulnerability, whether it's literally theft of credentials or exploiting a vulnerability in the application software itself or in the structure. Uh, and that obviously ties to the uh, list item number seven of the OAuth sub 10 list, identification and authentication failures. And then lastly, uh, the other one that I want to highlight is injection. Um, and SQL injection is, I think, like for the last 15 or 20 years, like the problem that as obvious as it is to solve, um, and as much as we as a community have been telling people, like they just keep happening. Um, but this is the use of a blind trust application framework, as an example, uh, that an attacker can exploit to take a, a vulnerable query, right? Someone that all the right intentions when they develop the query, but unknowingly there's a vulnerability to be able to form a SQL injection attack. And as Chuck mentioned, if you missed, we'll extract data from a database, even though that database has encryption in it. And that's obviously item number three on the list. So moving on from the really side, I wanted to give you two real world examples. Um, and as you can imagine, we could probably come up with hundreds of examples um, of applications where you know, either a vulnerable applications been or this logical vulnerability. The first is, I'll be talking about is Marriott. Um, and this is the breach that they in 18. Um, if you recall, there, there was also another breach in 2020, but also 18 breach first. They acquired a, a, another hotel, which apparently had been compromised back in 2016. So it took them almost two full years to identify that compromise. Start off as a spear phishing uh, attack um, and enabled them. Compromise a number of internal systems. Uh, 
they performed a bunch of credential harvesting, identified access, uh, admin level access to the data that stores sensitive information right. about folks. Yes. Sorry to uh, interrupt. Uh, we have a tiny bit of lagging. Could you maybe disable the video so we hopefully have a better audio quality? Sure. Sure. All right. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Apologies for that. San Diego internet uh, usually is really good, but today doesn't seem like it wants to cooperate. Anyhow, um, moving on, I'll quickly run you through the Marriott uh, use case um, again. So Marriott, again, 2018 uh, compromised via a spear phishing attack, which then led to a lateral movement within the environment, ultimately credential harvesting. Uh, and then they got access to database admin credentials, which allowed them to exfiltrate, they're saying up to 500 million guest records, which includes credit cards, personal name, information, uh, addresses, and even some cases, even passport information and, and images of passport data, which as you can imagine, I wouldn't want anyone else's hands. And then again, in 2020, they had a much smaller scale breach, about 5 million records stolen, but the same sort of process. So, you know, when you think about of a company, the sheer size of Marriott, with the amount of, of capital they have to invest in security, uh, these types of attacks can happen even for organizations that are that well-funded. And then the application vulnerability side, I wanted to highlight a SQL injection attack that occurred uh, several years ago, impacting 7-Eleven, where attackers um, performed a SQL injection attack against a publicly facing uh, web server. Um, ultimately, that enabled them to get access to a sensitive database that house over 130 million credit card numbers, which are stolen. Um, the good news in this situation is that the, the attacker was ultimately identified and then uh, ended up, I think they're still in jail, I think a 20 year sentence, but that occurred back in 2010. Uh, and then in more recently, um, not mentioned on this slide, but in 2019, 7-Eleven in Japan actually uh, took to market a pay app. Uh, and they had a pretty critical flaw in the design of the application where password resets didn't require any sort of authentication. So you could literally open up the application, put in an email address and ask for your password to be reset and be able to right there in, in, in the menu window, be able to reset the password, which was a massive flaw um, for obvious reasons. Uh, over over $600,000 of, of consumer uh, cash was stolen in that event. And they ended up shutting down the application and never uh, reintroducing it to the market. So pretty catastrophic impact, both to you know the business model that they want to approach, and also all the poor consumers that are affected. So, sort of in summary, when you think about the traditional encryption controls, you know we've been sort of asked to use over the last ten or fifteen years, like full disk encryption, transparent disk encryption, database encryption, cloud storage encryption, you know popular things like S3 encryption or Blob encryption, in which nowadays have been simplified to literally checking a box off in an admin panel or file share encryption, they're not gonna help you in these situations because they're designed for very different types of threats and frankly, threats that are, that are dated. Um, so in most cases, we're sort of on our own. But that being said, they can protect you if someone wants to steal your, your laptop or if you're running an old Commodore and they wanna walk into your house and steal that, they can definitely protect against that. Um, or, you know, literally walking into a, a data center, um, whether it's one that you operate or that a cloud provider operates for you and stealing, you know, servers out of racks, which is a highly unlikely scenario. Um, the other thing is, and this was mentioned earlier, I think Anastasia covered it, maybe Glenn, you may have touched on it. Um, you know, a lot of these encryption controls do help you provide literally the checkbox. So I think as an industry, from an AppSec point of view, uh, there's definitely approaches we can take to sort of mitigate the risk um, and have more robust solutions in place. Um, but one of the areas that I'd like to see sort of more improvement is on the compliance side, whether things like GDPR or HIPAA or PCI, that those sort of bodies and frameworks start to take uh, encryption and drill down into controls that are more effective versus what I refer to as checkbox solutions, like the ones that I mentioned on the slide here. So now I want to hand it over back to Chuck so he can talk about the, the better approach. Um, over to you, Chuck. Sorry about that. Yeah, thank you, Weiss. Um, yeah, and I definitely agree with what you said, which is that, you know, I would love to see the audit and compliance folks get more granular in, in kind of when they look at encryption, because it really is currently it's basically do you encrypt your data or not? That's really seems to be the level of questioning that they have. 
But the reality, as I mentioned earlier, is you know once you've encrypted the data, then all you've done is shift the problem. So now it's okay, the data is encrypted, but how are you protecting the keys? And so that's uh, really what we would like to see, you know, kind of as an industry growth to, to move towards. Or, or or sometimes you also get uh, people that maybe don't understand the difference between um, at rest and in transit uh, encryption. So they would say, oh, our data is encrypted because we use TLS and well, that you know protects against some types of attacks, but certainly not all of them, as we talked about earlier. So, really, what what we should be doing is is encrypting data, you know, higher in the stack. So, um, I'm hoping you guys can see my my pointer, but if not, I'll just kind of talk through this uh, thing on the right, where it's like you know this is kind of the, the you think of it like kind of like an application stack. So you've got you know bulk storage at the bottom, that's where the database stores its files. And then you've got a web server up here that talks to the database server. And then you've got uh, you know, some sort of a client application, whether it's a mobile app or it could be a JavaScript you know, type client uh, on a web page. And then there's a, a user that's you know, using all this stuff. So if what you want to be doing, if possible, is, is you want to have you know, encryption happening as high in the stack as possible. Because what that's going to give you is that you know, fewer devices in, in that are going to see the data. So I mean, you think in the extreme case, if you know, if the if the human you know says okay well I'm going to use some sort of code word instead of my you know uh, social security number that I'm going to put in I'm going to put in a, a fake number then obviously then you know the encryption is happening all the way in his head or her head and therefore none of these systems are going to see the real data but you know that's not practical unless you're you know one of the Navajo code talkers maybe from World War II you know most of the time you're going to say okay we need you know, an automated system to do the encryption, but we want to be happening, you know, here at the JavaScript or client or the mobile app. And, and the reality, you know, is that you know, the more transparent the encryption is and the decryption is, then really the, the more exposure you have. So, you know, down here at the bottom, if, you know, stuff is encrypted at the, you know, bulk storage type layer, then, you know, it's only going to be kind of controlled by the keys that are used to, uh, you know, as far as who can access that so that, you know, the, anything that's on the database server is going to be able to access that bulk encryption because it needs to be able to access its files, but then there'd be other administrators and stuff that can directly access the bulk storage uh, for things like backups. Um, you have to wonder if, yeah, if you're, store, if you're encrypting at that layer uh, and so the files themselves are not encrypted, then probably your backups are not encrypted or at least not encrypted in the same way. You might have to be separately encrypting your backups. So there's, you know, kind of more headaches there. Um, you know, so the next layer up is at the, the database server layer where it's like, okay, that's where you would have, you know, what's called sometimes transparent data encryption, but for some databases or any other sort of kind of database server type encryption. And that's a little bit better because there's, you know, fewer people that have access to the database server than have access to both the database server and the bulk storage system and, and backups and stuff. But there's still quite a few people that have access to this. And, and in particular, you know, the web application server has access to all of the data on the database server and there's no way that you know whatever is controlling this stuff is going to be able to know you know who is the um, ultimately the user that's trying to access this data and you know what data they should have access to. So if you're you know our goal is to try to segregate this data more uh, at the database server layer so that um, you know, uh, so that things that you know are connecting to the database directly are not going to have the keys they need to be able to decrypt all of the data. So this is kind of a, a picture of that. So what, what you end up with here is that you'll have some sort of a key server, you know, so this could be something you build yourself or, you know, some of the cloud service providers have those sorts of things, uh, other commercial vendors have them as well, that is gonna, you know, interface with the user. So whether directly or indirectly, maybe through the client or, or something, there will be, you know, some authorization and authentication that happens so that they'll be able to, the key server will know, okay, this is the user that's trying to access the data and these are the, therefore, these are the keys that I'm going to give, um, you know, that are appropriate for that user that can be used. And so ideally that would be happening here on the client, but it could potentially happen at the, the web application server, or in some limited cases, it could even happen at the database server. If you've got um, kind of client side encryption, client aware encryption, I guess that's happening there, uh, where it passes the keys through uh, that some databases use. Yeah, so the idea is that, you know, we're separating the data through the control of encryption keys. And so you could almost think of it kind of like a, a two system control where, you know, the, the 
application server itself is is got you know some access controls that's going to say okay this user is supposed to be able to access you know this type of data on the system but then you know that's not sufficient they also need to have the right keys that go with it so um now you know what you do end up doing potentially is you know implementing you know authentication and authorization logic but, uh, on both on both sides but that's kind of the point here is that we want to be more granular and get more specific so the idea is that even if there's a, a SQL injection, for example, in the application that's going to basically bypass this level of authentication check, all you're going to get access to is a bunch of uh, encrypted data, and the only keys you're going to have to decrypt any of that data is going to be the, the keys that are associated with that user already, so it's the data that they can already access. So, you know, as I mentioned, this, you know, protects you against, you know, not just SQL injection, but also maybe authentication or authorization bypass types of attacks, what we used to call insecure direct object references, you know, various types of application layer attacks and, and logical attacks as well, as Weiss talked about earlier. And then uh, it also gives you some defense in depth. So you've got a, then uh, you've got, again, fewer people that have access to the keys and, and hopefully, you know, basically nobody has access to all of the keys. So your, your database server admins, your, your web application server admins, all the people that work at your cloud provider or you know, other you know, customers of that cloud provider, you know, none of them are gonna be able to, you know, even if things are misconfigured or that cloud pro service provider is breached or tokens or whatever that are used to potentially access some of these systems, uh, you know, get checked into GitHub or something, you know, you're still not gonna have the keys that you need in order to be able to decrypt the data or uh, to encrypt data that's going to be um, you know, use basically for the, uh, to, to add data into the database or update data. So uh, just a simple example here is, you know, let's say we've got a medical record system. And so um, the idea here is that we want to encrypt, you know, some pretty uh, sensitive data that's there. So we're not encrypting everything, you know, we're probably not going to be encrypting like patient names and addresses and some of that other stuff. Um, uh, as Anastasia mentioned earlier, you know, uh, one of the limitations you'll have is that, you know, if you're encrypting data, then it becomes more difficult to, to sort and filter and, and you know, select down those. Um, not to say that it can't be done. There are ways it can be done, but it, there's definitely performance impacts. So uh, we're going to say, you know, really what we care about is things like, you know, test results or diagnoses or, or other, you know, sort of data values like that, that are pretty uh, uh, sensitive for this person and need to be protected by, you know, HIPAA or maybe other sort of regulatory requirements. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have the system going to create an asymmetric key pair for each patient. So, you know, myself as a patient, I would have, you know, a, a key pair that's created within the system that uh, is going to, you know, have that relationship that like you would normally see in, in what we call public and private keys. Uh, in this case, we're going to call them something a little different because it's, uh, I think it makes it more clear that we're going to have basically a read key and a write key. So we're going to have one key that is used to read data out of this system, any of these you know, protected fields or attachments, and then a separate one that's used to write the data. And so the idea here is that, you know, a patient application, for example, would, would only get the read key. So that, that way the patient can, can only read their data. They can't create any new lab results or, or sensitive data in the system, can't write themselves prescriptions, for example. You know, they're only gonna be able to read, you know, their data, but they get to read pretty much all of their data because it's, you know, it's their health. And uh, uh, conversely, a, a lab, for example, might, might basically be the opposite, where they can only write data. So they're not going to be able to read any of the existing data in that patient's file, uh, you know, or decrypt it specifically, I guess. Uh, but what they can do is they can write data. So they can create new documents or attachments that are kind of like lab reports or, you know, values and things that uh, associate with lab work. And the idea is that, you know, they're putting that data in there and basically kind of like a write only fashion. So they can't even read their own data after they've uh, put it in there, although certainly they would you know, probably have copies of it on their own systems as well. And then uh, a doctor is going to have, you know, both keys. So they're going to need to both read the data that the lab put in, but also write, you know, other data and diagnoses and stuff that uh, you know, the patient is going to see. So they would get both. So the idea here is that, you know, depending on how this is all implemented, you can have, you know, kind of the, you're going to have the you know, very granular access control around, you know, these keys specifically for this patient. But then there's even just more general things that are you can enforce that it's like, hey, the patient application itself, regardless of which patient is logged in, it's only ever going to get read keys. 
So if you know you're kind of able to do some kind of additional layers of access control by saying you know that the patient application is never going to get a right key regardless of, of what happens, and and vice versa for the lab, so that you're going to you know be able to ensure that uh, you know you've got like I said those multiple layers to ensure that you've got as much trust as possible that only the right people are able to do the right you know operations into your data. And so if you want to read more about a uh, a similar example, uh, there's one in the MongoDB documentation where they talk about uh, what they call field level encryption that we'll talk about in a little bit, but kind of walk through exactly like, yeah, this is how we set it up and this is how you can implement it in order to ensure that you get the um, security controls that you want to have in place. So now, it, so now we've got the general idea of what we want to do, then let's talk about how we could do it. So there's a, a basically three options that uh, you've got available to you and to, you know, to implement this type of encryption into a system. So the first is, is what's called column level encryption. So the idea here is that we're going to encrypt only, you know, specific sensitive columns, you know, maybe your credit card numbers, socials, passport numbers, whatever. And that, that way, you know, each of those columns will actually be encrypted separately. So, you know, you might have some people that can access credit card numbers, but can't access passport numbers and, and vice versa. So it gives you again a level of access control, not just for users uh, as far as like database admins and stuff, but also potentially different systems. So your payment system, you know, would have keys to be able to access the credit card numbers, but you know, not access some of those other sensitive fields, perhaps. And so that's the uh, that's the idea here. So it's kind of more at the um, at the client level, but it could be at the specific user level as well, and. You know, again, we're getting that separation even uh, against the database encryption, uh, database administrators. And the key here is that the, the decryption and encryption is not happening on the database server, at least uh, in the, the best implementation of this. So what you want is stuff that's really what uh, generally these are implemented in the kind of client library that's used to access the database server. So in something like, you know, MySQL or Postgres SQL, there'll be a you know, a library that you use on the web application server kind of side to access the database and the encryption is built into that. Um, so you would, you know, at this level of the application server provide the keys to that that would then get passed through to the database server. So uh, there's a few different implementations of this. It's, this is a pretty common technique. Um, so, I mean, it's pretty much all uh, databases support it. You know, SQL, Microsoft has a couple different kind of variants of it. Uh, where they call it, you know, either always encrypted data or you know, column encryption. On Google Cloud, um, specifically, it has kind of implementations for both MySQL and, and PostgreSQL. And, and the reason they have that is because it's basically interfacing with their key management system. So it gives them a, the ability to kind of have that, um, you know, a, a more centralized place where you're storing the keys. But again, in both cases, you can see like based on this URL, this is all client side. And by client side here, you know, that could be up here on the actual client, a mobile client or a JavaScript client, or it could be on kind of the database client library that's you know, accessing the database server. And then you can also do database client encryption on AWS. So here's an example of that. Um, you know, there's probably you know, lots of other um, potential implementations. Uh, one thing to be aware of, though, is that um, I believe Oracle uses the term column level encryption for some of their stuff, but in reality, it's more like transparent data encryption where the, it's happening kind of all on the database server and it's, uh, you know, doesn't have the kind of security properties we want here where you can get more granular kind of control of the keys. So you do have to be a little bit careful with some of this stuff that uh, different uh, systems or database implementations are going to call things a little bit different or call or use the same term for something a little bit different. So it's definitely worth uh, you know, doing a little bit of research on that when you need to. And so the, the next option is, is what's called field level encryption. And so this is a basically, a, sometimes people will say field level encryption when they really mean column level encryption, because what field level encryption at the, at the strictest sense is, is, is you're, you're, it's, it's basically more specific than column level encryption. You're going to have the ability to encrypt a, a specific uh, data fields that are in a column, but you're not necessarily encrypting all of the rows of that. So we're going to have a um, specific fields that, uh, you know, that uh, the data in that field or maybe even data in other fields are going to drive the encryption that's used. 
So for whatever reason, you know, maybe we want to encrypt, you know, encrypt just the American Express credit card numbers. And so we could do that with field level encryption. Maybe we want to, you know, encrypt only the credit card numbers that are associated with customers that are in Europe for GDPR type reasons. You could even do something with field level encryption where you could use different encryption um, algorithms based on, you know, where the user is. So um, you could think of a world maybe that, you know, in America, they mandate that you must use AES to encrypt data, but then in you know some other country, they mandate that you must use some other algorithm to encrypt the data. And so you would need to you know have more granularity there in, in what you're doing. So that's uh, you know gives you the ability to, to meet those kind of use cases. And so again, the, it's not happening on the database server. It, generally, for field level encryption, it's going to be all the way up here on the client, although it could be down here. Uh, on, the, on the web application server, but the key is that it's, you know, again, not on the database server itself. And so there's really two main implementations of this that the, that I've identified, you know, so one is, you know, MongoDB was really the pioneer for this. Uh, they created a whole kind of mechanism around this uh, that you can read about in their documentation at this link here. And um, so they, they go into, you know, kind of how they you can set up this on the, the client side uh, and they have, you know, full support for it as part of their client libraries that are used to connect to a, a Mongo database. And then um, Amazon does this as well, although strangely it's part of their CloudFront um, because they're basically doing field level encryption that kind of starts, I think, all the way at like the HTTP field level. And uh, again, kind of with that idea that you're encrypting data as soon as possible uh, in, the, in the overall kind of stack. So that's an interesting implementation that you can get into uh, you know, looking at their documentation. So, so those two, field level encryption and column level encryptions are the, the two kind of um, met, uh, automated mechanisms, I guess you could say, implementations that exist that, uh, to, to do this. And so the last, the last option is really, you know, you just gotta do it yourself. So, you know, we can do uh, application level encryption. So the idea here is that, you know, you've got, logic built into the client, whether it's JavaScript or a mobile app or whatever, and it's going to do all of the, you know, encryption and decryption. So this is, you know, obviously the most flexible because you're, you know, if building it yourself, you can do whatever you want. It's, it's also kind of technology agnostic. You're not tying yourself to a particular database backend or cloud technology, like we were just talking about with field level encryption. Um, you know, for if you've got multi-platform tech systems where maybe you've got multiple types of applications that are built on different platforms that need to access the same databases, then you know, uh, doing it as kind of at the application layer is helpful because it allows you to be agnostic to kind of what's underneath and uh, what's above as well. So it gives you a lot of flexibility with the you know the cost of, of just being you know a little bit more work and, and complexity for you to, to deal with. So again, you know, you're not encrypting the data on the database server, you're doing it in your own custom application logic. And, you know, the, uh, what you can do is, uh, like I said, this is kind of technology agnostic, but there are different, you know, vendors that can help you in implementation. So again, you're kind of tying yourself to that vendor, but, you know, you can find vendors that will basically be cloud agnostic. So you could, you know, use the same data encryption scheme, whether you're putting data on, premise or in the cloud at Amazon or in the cloud in Azure, you know, and, you know, allow you to, to move data around without being kind of tied to that you know, underlying technology. So if you, if you want to learn more about ALE, ALE, uh, you could, you could grab yourself a, a glass of ale and uh, read up on a couple of these documents. So we've got, um, you know, a, a pretty good article here from InfoQ that talks about, you know, software architects and how you can use app, application layer encryption. And then uh, a recent Forbes article as well that talks really about the specifics of what they call, they call it entity level encryption. But the idea is that you bring it as granular as possible in you know, the data that you're encrypting and decrypting. And that allows you to, to be a, a defense against ransomware as well. So generally, you know, ransomware, if it you know, kind of gets into your system, is gonna be operating you know, down here at either like the bulk storage layer or maybe some ransomware is kind of database aware, where if it you know was able to get uh, database credentials, you could go and start you know encrypting a bunch of data in your database. Um, then, uh, but if you're if you're 
uh, if your data is you know encrypted at a higher layer, then that's not going to necessarily help them. So now, I guess to be clear, so I mean ransomware that just goes in and tries to ransom your data, you know they could they could encrypt the data down at the lower layer, and you're still going to have to deal with that as far as getting uh, you know through that hurdle. Hopefully, you've got good backups that are you know kind of protecting against that sort of attack. So the, the really more concerning is, is kind of what we've seen this year where ransomware has moved from just kind of preventing you from accessing your data until you pay to also being able to like steal your data and potentially posting it online and, and doing other things with it. So the data theft portion of, of uh, ransomware is what uh, you know, this entity level encryption that they call it would really help you with. So uh, just a few kind of parting words of, of crypto advice, uh, you know, so if you are uh, involved in a cryptographic project where you've got to, you know, encrypt some data and take care of it properly, then, uh, you know, here's our, our list of, of do's and don'ts. I'm not going to read through them all. Hopefully they uh, look familiar and there's, there's lots of good uh, documentation on the OAuth uh, site and other places as well that kind of goes into the details. But uh, really what it comes down to is that there, there are a lot of details you've got to get right. You know, I uh, mentioned earlier that, you know, the the algorithms that we have today, things like AES and the you know, GCM encryption mode are, are very strong, but there is, there is opportunity for potentially um, some implementation flaws that could cause you to have issues. And this is my last slide. So I know we're, we're basically at time as far as we're getting into the Q&A portion. So I uh, definitely uh, appreciate you guys all coming and I uh, hope that you've put some questions. If you haven't already, put some into the uh, Whova chat and we'll be happy to answer them uh, as many as we can during this period of time. Uh, you can also feel free to reach out to us via email. You know, Weiss and I are, are happy to, to help uh, as far as responding to any, any questions that you have after, after the talk as well.